Welcome back, guys. So this is your Dr. Piri again. We are finishing up with part B of lecture eight. Remember the part A of lecture eight? We, in general, lecture eight, we are looking at platelets, functions in these platelets. In part A, we had an introduction to platelets, and then we also looked at thrombopoiesis, the process in which platelets are produced in the body, especially from the red bone marrow. Then we also looked at platelet count, how you can do platelet count in the lab. Then we also looked at hemostasis. And hemostasis, these are mechanisms that are involved in blood clotting. And remember, hemostasis, you have two major types of hemostasis or two major stages. The first stage, which is called primary hemostasis. Here, you're just looking at the formation of the platelet plug. After activation of platelets, they are going to adhere to the collagen. Then there are also other receptors that can attract other platelets. They will start producing those chemicals that are released from the granules, and then they will attract other platelets, and then the platelets will become sticky, and then you're going to have aggregation of platelets that will result into the formation of the platelet plug. And then on top of that, you have activation of the coating factors. Remember the 12 coating factors? They are numbered from 1 to 13, but they are 12. Why? It's because we said coating number 6 was removed from that list because scientists realized to say that coating factor number 6 was the same coating factor number 5 after activation. So it was removed from the list. So after activation of those coating factors, they will result into the conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin. Fibrin will polymerize and then it will form fibrin strands or fibrin polymer. That will now go and cover the platelet plug, and some of it they will actually go inside of the platelets to reinforce um, the stability of the clot, so that it doesn't get dislodged, and then it can cause thromboemboli, and these they can they can block or occlude blood vessels that can result into ischemia or infection if it happens in the heart. So now we are looking into part B of lecture eight so here we're going to discuss the system of anticoagulation or fibrinolysis so after the formation of the clot there is need for this clot to be digested after there is complete repair of the endometrium so if there is complete repair of the endometrium you know to say that that can no longer be lost via that opening because it's now complete repair so you need to get rid of this clot otherwise if it remains there it will obstruct the movement of blood or blood flow. And on top of that, it can get dislodged, then to result into embolism or thromboembolism. So you need a system that will digest or break down these clots. So this system, you have fibrinolysis. So these are enzymes that are involved in breaking down or to degrade the clot. Then you also have anticoagulation system. The anticoagulation system are the ones that are going to prevent formation of clot when there is no damage to the endometrium or to the, to the endothelium. So if there is no damage to the lining of blood vessels or to the endothelium, you don't need clots to form in there. So to maintain the fluidity of blood, you need the anticoagulants, the natural anticoagulants that are produced by the body, then they will inhibit formation of clots. So it's very important. So now let's go into this information. So what you need to know is that the tendency of blood to clot is balanced by the following reactions. So you have reactions that will prevent clotting inside the blood vessel. So these are just reactions that are preventing or to prevent clotting inside the blood vessels. They will prevent the formation of clots inside the blood vessels. There are also reactions that break down clots that form. So sometimes you can have formation of clots. So you need to break them down. Otherwise, they can occlude blood vessels, like I said. So you also have reactions when clots form. They are going to digest or they are going to, to, to degrade those clots. So reactions that break down clots that form. Then you also have reactions that both prevent or break down clots that form. So there are also other reactions that are more general, so they can prevent the formation of clots. And if clots forms, they can also break down the clots that forms. So these are basically 
three major reactions that are involved to maintain the fluidity of blood. So reactions that prevent clotting inside the blood vessels, you have reactions that we break down clots that form, and then you also have reactions that prevent or break down clots that form. So these interactions causes clots to form at the site when blood vessel is injured, but keeps vessel lumen free of clots. So they are going to prevent the formation of clots when there's no damage. And when there's damage, they're going to be inhibited so that you have formation of clots. So there's a balance between the systems that can, uh, that can enhance clotting and the system that can inhibit or break down the clot. So there's a balance depending on what is happening in the body. When there's no damage, you find that these systems will be there to prevent clot formation. But when there's damage, then the other factors will be activated that will result into the formation of the clot. The endothelial cells are the main sources of agents that help maintain normal blood fluidity. So the endothelial cells that are lining the blood vessels, so you have the inner lining of the blood vessels, those cells are called the endothelial cells. So these endothelial cells, because they are in direct contact with blood, you find that they will have a lot of these agents that can prevent blood clotting. And if there is a clot that is forming, they can also produce enzymes that will be embedded within the plasma membrane of these cells to digest the clots. So they will prevent attachment of platelets, for instance, they can inactivate platelets so that they don't become sticky. Then there's just normal flow of blood in the cardiovascular system. These agents are of two general types. So you have paracrine factors and anticoagulant factors. The paracrine factor is whereby maybe the endothelial cells are producing certain proteins or certain factors that will have an effect on the nearby cells. So these nearby cells, they could be the platelets that are moving nearby the endothelial cells or they can have an effect on nearby endothelial cells as well. So you have paracrine factors that will have an effect on the nearby cells. And then you also have anticoagulants that are produced by these cells and these, they will inhibit coagulation. So now looking at the reactions that prevent clotting inside the blood vessels, just a bit of information there. So what are these proteins or substances that can prevent clotting inside blood vessels? So the first one is antithrombin-3. From the name itself, antithrombin-3, it means that it's going to inhibit the activities of thrombin. And remember, when uh, prothrombin is activated, into thrombin, and this thrombin is the one that will convert fibrinogen into fibrin, and this fibrin will form a polymer, so it will start polymerizing to form those strands of fibrin. So the antithrombin is going to inhibit the thrombin, meaning that it's inhibiting this thrombin enzyme, then it won't be able to convert fibrinogen into fibrin. Without fibrin, there is no polymerization, there is no formation of this fibrin polymer. So, so it's going to inhibit clotting to some extent. But you also need to know that this antithrombin-3 is a circulating protease inhibitor that binds to cell, cell line proteases in the coagulation system. So you have most of those clotting factors, which are enzymes, they are cell line proteases. So they will be inhibited by antithrombin-3. So on top of inhibiting the thrombin, it can also inhibit other coating factors, which are enzymes. So it locks the activity of cell line proteases as coating factors. So these are coating factors that are cell line proteases. So they are, it's going to inhibit these enzymes, which are coating factors. Hence, it's inhibiting the activation of the common pathway, remember you have the extrinsic and the intrinsic pathway, that will result into the activation of the common pathway. And this common pathway is the one that will result into conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin. So if these coating factors are inhibited to some extent, those pathways are inhibited and then there will be no coagulation. That's why it's called antithrombin-3. Then you also have heparin. Heparin can also be found on the surface membrane of endothelial cells, and then it's also being produced by other cells. And this heparin is naturally occurring anticoagulant 
that is a mixture of sulfated, sulfated polysaccharides. It inhibits the active forms of vitamin. It inhibits the active forms of factors 9, 10, 11, and 12. So what you need to know is that sometimes the heparin can also form a complex with antithrombin 3. So heparin is found on the plasma membrane of endothelial cells. So as antithrombin 3 is moving, it can go and bind to it, and then it will activate the antithrombin 3 that will inhibit the cell line proteases. On top of that, the, the heparin itself is an anticoagulant. So it's going to inhibit the active form of factors 9, 10, 11, and 12. So they're here. So these are the factors that will be inhibited by the heparin. So it's inhibiting, inhibiting factor 9, factor 10, factor 11, and factor 12. So you can see the factor 12 is the one that is involved in the intrinsic pathway. Then you can see here, factor 10 is also being inhibited. If factor 10 is being inhibited, you know to say that the common pathway won't take place. It's also inhibiting factor 9. The factor 9, it's involved in the intrinsic pathway as well. And also factor 11, which is also involved in the intrinsic pathway. So these factors are inhibited. So once they're inhibited, those coagulation pathways will also be inhibited. So there will be no clotting. Then you also have this prostaglandin, which is called prostacycrine. So prostacycrine is a prostaglandin produced by endothelial cells and white blood cells. It inhibits platelets adhesion and release. Remember, once platelets are activated, there is platelet release reaction whereby they are going to release the contents of the granules. And for them to go in the attach, you need the glycoprotein to go in the attach to Van Weerabrand factor. So you find that the prostacycrine is going to inhibit the interaction between platelets and the Van Weerabrand factor. So because of that, it's going to inhibit activation of platelets. So once there is no activation of platelets, there is no adhesion of platelets, and there is no release of those contents that are found within the granules. So it's one of the protein that is also inhibiting the activity of platelets so that they are maintained within the cardiovascular system. They are not activated. As long as there is no injury, they won't be activated because of the prostacycline that is being produced by the endothelial cells. So it's also found within the lining of the endothelial cells, so it's able to deactivate platelets. Okay, so now we move on to reactions that break down clots that form. So these are clots that form. So what enzymes are breaking down these clots that can form within the cardiovascular system? So now we are looking at the fibrinolysis. Fibrinolysis is breakdown or lysis of blood clots inside the blood vessel. So the breakdown of these clots inside the blood vessel is called fibrinolysis. It helps remove clots from lumen of blood vessel. This process requires a substance called plasmin or fibrinolysin in active form, which is called plasminogen or profibrinolysin. So this is the inactive form of the enzyme that is required for fibrinolysis. So you have protein which is called plasmin. So this is the active form. The other name for plasmin is also called fibrinolysin. So this is the enzyme that is involved to break down the fibrin polymers into fragmentations or fibrin polymers. Then, it's supposed to be in its inactive form, so it has to be activated for it to be functional. So there are systems that will activate this enzyme to become active. So in inactive form, they are called plasminogen or profibrinolysin. So the factors causing fibrinolysis here, you know, to say it's plasminogen that will be converted into plasmin, and the plasmin is the one that is involved in digestion of fibrin polymers. But for it to be activated from plasminogen into plasmin, there are two systems that are involved. So we have the extrinsic plasminogen activator system. And then we also have the intrinsic plasminogen activator system. So these are the ones that are going to activate 
the conversion of plasminogen into plasmin and plasmin will start now the fibrinolysis, the breaking down of fibrin. Okay, so these are the two systems. So you have the extrinsic system and the intrinsic system. So these are the activators of fibrinogen into fibrin. So they are going to facilitate the conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin. So you have the intrinsic factors and the extrinsic factors that can activate fibrin. I'm not talking about the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway of coagulation. This is different. So you have the extrinsic factors that can be produced by other cells. For instance, in the endothelial cells, they can also produce urokinase. So you have streptokinase, urokinase, and recombinant plasminogen activator protein. So you have recombinant plasminogen activator protein. So this protein is produced by biotechnology. So you have biotechnology that can produce recombinant, plasmino, uh, recombinant tissue plasminogen activator. So it's called recombinant tissue plasminogen activator that can be produced and given to patients that are having uh, disorders of coagulation. So maybe they're having excessive blood clots. So you want to activate the plasminogen into plasmin so that it can digest those clots. So you can give this recombinant tissue plasminogen activator that is going to activate the plasminogen into plasmin. Then on top of that, you have the intrinsic factors that are associated within the blood vessels themselves. So you have the factor 12. So the activated factor 12 can also stimulate the conversion of pro caricrine into caricrine. And this caricrine is also an activator that will go and activate the conversion of plasminogen into plasmin. Then you also have the tissue plasminogen activator that is also coming from the endothelial cells and other cells. So you have this tissue plasminogen activator that will activate the conversion of plasminogen into plasmin. The other name of plasminogen is also called pro-fibrinolysin. The other name for plasmin is fibrinolysin. So once it has been activated, in this form, this enzyme now is capable to degrade or to digest fibrin into fibrin fragments. So it's going to digest fibrin into fibrin fragments, and then there's also digestion of those platelets, red blood cells, and then the clot will start reducing in diameter. Then you also have the inhibitors of this system. The inhibitors, you also have extrinsic factors and the intrinsic factors. So extrinsic factors or inhibitors of plasminogen. And these inhibitors, it's either they are inhibiting the activity of plasmin. So once plasmin is inhibited, it's unable to digest fibrin into fibrin fragments. And on top of that, these inhibitors, they can also inhibit the activators. So they can inhibit these enzymes that are activating plasminogen into plasmin. So once the activators are inhibited by the inhibitor, it means this process won't take place. So some of these inhibitors, you have the extrinsic inhibitors and also intrinsic inhibitors. The extrinsic inhibitors, they could be drugs that are produced outside the body. The intrinsic inhibitors, they are produced by the body itself. So the liver is capable of producing these proteins and these proteins are enzymes that are going to inhibit Another enzyme, which is called plasmin, they can also inhibit the activator of plasminogen. So some of these enzymes or proteins that are produced by the liver, you have the alpha-2 antiplasmin. So you can see from the name itself, alpha-2 antiplasmin. It means that it's against the activity of plasmin. So it's going to inhibit the plasmin itself. And it can also inhibit these activators of plasminogen, like I said. We also have production of alpha-2 macroglobulin. The alpha-2 macroglobulin can also inhibit the plasmin, but it can also inhibit the activators of plasminogen. So you are reducing the concentration of plasmin, then you are also reducing the chances of breaking down of fibrin or fibrinolysis. So you have clots. So it means these inhibitors, they can give in to patients with bleeding disorders. For instance, maybe 
there is dysfunctional in terms of producing a stable platelet plug or fibrin mesh. So you, they can be given this so that you find that that fibrin mesh will be maintained for quite a bit of time. So these are some of the uh, proteins that are produced by the liver. And then you also have other drugs that are part of the extrinsic inhibitors of plasminogen. So these extrinsic inhibitors of plasminogen or plasmin, you have examples. For instance, you have this chemical, which is called EACA, epsilon amino caproic acid. So it's called epsilon amino caproic acid that can inhibit plasminogen to be converted to plasmin. And once you have plasmin, it can also inhibit the plasmin activity. Then you also have transamic acid. Transamic acid is another acid that can inhibit this conversion. Then you also have a, a protein, a protein. The a protein, these are also proteins that can also inhibit the plasmin and also the conversion of plasminogen into a plasmin. So the extrinsic inhibitors of this system, you have epsilon, aminocoproic acid, then transamic acid, and then you also have a proteinine. So these are going to inhibit. So they can be used as drugs that are going to inhibit the conversion of plasminogen into plasmin. Okay, so move on. Let's look at reactions that both prevent and break down clots that form. So these are more general. So they can prevent the formation of clots. And when there's a clot, they can also break down the clots. So the first one is thrombomodulin. So the thrombomodulin is a protein that can bind thrombin from the name itself. Just like you have calmodulin, it's a protein that can bind calcium. Thrombomodulin is a protein that can bind thrombin. So from thrombomodulin, thrombin binding protein produced by all endothelial cells except those in the cerebral microcirculation. So in the cerebral microcirculation, you don't have thrombomodulin. So that's why it's very difficult to get rid of the clots that are formed within the cerebral microcirculation because you don't have this thrombomodulin that can bind with thrombin. So once you have thrombin there, they will activate fibrinogen into fibrin, and then you have development of clots that are not reducing because you don't have thrombomodulin. So it is found on the surface of these endothelial cells, like I said. Thrombin binds to thrombomodulin to form thrombomodulin thrombin complex that activates protein C. So the thrombomodulin can bind to thrombin, or thrombin can bind to thrombomodulin, forming the thrombomodulin thrombin complex. This thrombomodulin thrombin complex is going to activate protein C. The activated protein C, together with a core protein S, they can inactivate factors five and factor eight. So you know to say factor five is the one that is involved in the common pathway. Remember the factor five complex? The factor five complex with activated factor 10, then with calcium and phospholipids is the one that is going to activate uh, prothrombin into thrombin. So if this factor eight is inactivated by the activated protein C, it means that the common pathway won't proceed. At the same time, it can also inactivate factor eight. And this factor eight, you know, to say it forms factor eight complex. And the factor eight complex is the one that is activating factor 10 into the active factor 10. So if factor eight is inhibited, the factor eight complex is also inhibited. If factor five is inhibited, the factor five complex, they are also inhibited. So it means the common pathway won't proceed as such. So because of that, there is this production of uh, conversion of prothrombin into thrombin, and then this thrombin won't activate fibrinogen into fibrin for the formation of the clots. So you find that the activated protein C is also going to reduce the formation of the clots. So they are going to prevent or inhibit the formation of the clots. So it also inactivates an inhibitor of tissue plasminogen activator, increasing the formation of plasmin. So here you have those inhibitor of plasminogen activator. Remember the plasminogen activator, you have enzymes like urokinase, you have 
tissue presbynogen activator. So those activators were inhibited by the other factors. Remember, you have within the body, you have the alpha-2 antiplasmin, you have the alpha-2 alpha two antiplasmin and also the alpha-2 macroglobulin. So those inhibitors are inhibited by protein C. So it's going to facilitate the conversion of plasminogen into plasmin. And this plasmin is going to digest it or it's going to digest the clots that are formed there. So it's also involved in breakdown of clots that are already formed. Why? It's because it's going to facilitate the activation of plasminogen to plasmin that is involved in fibrinolysis. So the plasmin or fibrinolysin breaks down fibrin and also fibrinogen. So it's, they are going to be broken down into fragments that are not strong enough to hold the clots. So this is what I'm talking about, just to summarize reactions that both prevent and also break down clots. So you have the endothelial cells, the plasma membrane of the endothelial cells, you have thrombomodule in protein. This thrombomodule in protein can bind with thrombin, forming the thrombomodule in thrombin complex that will activate protein C, and the activated protein C in the presence of protein S. So activated protein C, APC. This APC doesn't stand for antigen presenting cells. Here, it will stand for activated protein C. So the activated protein C with the protein S, they are going to inhibit the activation of factor eight. So you can see here, the active factor eight will be converted into the inactive factor eight. The, also the active factor five will be converted into the inactive factor five. So in simple terms, it's preventing the, uh, the activation of factor eight and factor five. That will stop the coagulation cascade. So the common pathway will be inhibited. At the same time, the activated protein C, we say it's going to inactivate the inhibitor of tissue plasminogen activator. So the, the inhibitor of tissue plasminogen activator, they're going to be inhibited. So you are going to have more activity of tissue plasminogen activator that is going to activate the conversion of plasminogen to plasmin. And the plasmin will result into digestion or breakdown of clots that have already formed within the cardiovascular system. So the plasmin now will result into lysis of fibrin, into fibrin fragments. Yeah, so I've also added a video to explain the physiology of coagulation and also the fibrinolysis system. So this you can watch at your own time. So now let's look at disorders associated with platelets or disorders of platelets. Okay, so this is just the last part of this lecture eight. We're looking at disorders of platelets. These are thrombocytes. So the disorders of platelets, it could be these disorders will result into an increase in platelets or a decrease in platelets. So why do you want to look at these disorders? So sometimes if you have a decrease in platelets, you find that bleeding time might increase. And also if you have dysfunction or clotting factor, sometimes the clotting, clotting time can also increase. So you, you want to look at these diseases that uh, affected due to platelets function, or sometimes you have an increase in platelets or a decrease in platelets. So let's just look at this, some of these diseases. But you know to say that this is more pathology. So in physiology, I just want you to appreciate why you're having an increase and in which diseases in particular can cause an increase in platelets and why do you have an increase in platelets and some of the diseases will cause a decrease in platelets and why are you having a decrease in platelets? So you need to appreciate that. And it's more pathology, but you need to know this information. So let's start. Okay, so platelet disorders may be divided into two categories by etiology. So based on etiology, you have two categories of platelet disorders. You have congenital disorders and then you have acquired disorders. The congenital, these are disorders that you are born with them and acquired those that you acquire with time, depending on maybe a disease that is affecting you 
and when you are born. So we have congenital and acquired fetal disorders. And then two additional categories by type. So you can also have another category by type. So these are thrombocytopenias and thrombocytopathies. Thrombocytopenias mainly it's a decrease in thrombocytes, and then you have thrombocytopathies. These are normal platelet counts, but these platelets are dysfunctional. So we find that they don't function well. So you have thrombocytopathies and thrombocytopenia. Thrombocytopenia is a decrease in platelet count. So let's start looking at thrombocytopenia. And the thrombocytopenia occur when platelet quantity is reduced and are caused by one of the three mechanisms. So it can be caused by a decrease in production in the bone marrow. Maybe something is interfering with the production of platelets. For instance, if you have less erythropoietin, you know, to say the production of platelets, they require the presence of this hormone called erythropoietin. I mean, uh, thrombopoietin, not erythropoietin, the thrombopoietin. The thrombopoietin is a hormone that is stimulating the development of hematopoietic stem cell to differentiate into megakaryocytes later on in the megakaryocytes, megakaryoblasts, megakaryocytes is the one that will start now forming the platelets. So if you don't have the thrombopoietin, the production of platelets in the bone marrow will decrease. So this thrombocytopenia could be due to decrease in production in the bone marrow or increase sequestration in the spleen. So the spleen is removing most of these platelets, then also accelerated destruction of platelets. So these three mechanisms, so you have decreased production in bone marrow, decreased or increased sequestration in the spleen and accelerated destruction of platelets. Then you have thrombocytopathies. So here you're having normal platelet count, but these platelets, they are not functioning well. So there's dysfunctional platelets or malfunctional platelets, if you want. Thrombocytopathies is a qualitative platelet disorder characterized by dysfunctional platelets. So these are thrombocytes that are dysfunctional. So which result in prolonged breeding time, effective clot formation, and a tendency to hemorrhage. So it's because these platelets are not functioning well. Maybe there's abnormal adhesion, there's a problem with adhesion, aggregation, or granule release. So you find that they are not forming the platelet plug very well. So that will result in two an increase in breeding time and also defective clot formation and also it tends to hemorrhage. So like I said, they may result from defects in any of the three critical platelet reaction. So adhesion, aggregation, or granule release. Then the famous disorder of platelets, it's called PEPARA. So this terminology is pronounced as pepara, pepara. So it's not pepula, it's pepara. So pepara is defined as pepperish discoloration of the skin and mucous membrane due to spontaneous extravasation of blood. So you find that the skin will appear pepo. Why? It's because there is extravasation of blood. So blood is moving from the cardiovascular system to the tissues. So there is Pepperish discoloration of the skin and the mucous membrane. Even the mucous membrane will be looking pepperish. Why? It's because you have spontaneous extravasation of blood moving to the tissues. The, these are symptoms rather than a disease entity. So pepara is not necessarily a disease, but it's more of a symptom of a particular disease that is developing within the body. So they are symptoms rather than a disease entity. So they are classified as non thrombocytic pepara or thrombocytic pepara. So you have non-thrombocytic pepara or thrombocytic pepara. The thrombocytic pepara, the non-thrombocytic pepara, you're not looking at the dysfunctional platelets. So here maybe the platelets are okay, but there are also other issues that will result into non-thrombocytic pepara. But you can also have thrombocytic pepara that is divided into primary or essential pepara then you have secondary or symptomatic pepara. So the primary or essential pepara, the cause of this pepara is unknown. But the secondary or symptomatic pepara, the cause is known. So I'll be discussing that.
So let's start by looking at non-thrombocytopenic papara. Non-thrombocytopenic papara is heterogeneous group of disease not mediated through the changes in blood platelets. So blood count, blood platelet count is still within the normal range. So it's not mediated through the changes in platelet counts or platelets themselves, but it's due to alteration in the capillary themselves that results in many instances in increased permeability. So there are other things that can increase the permeability of the blood vessels to the extent that red blood cells are able to move from the cardiovascular system into the tissues. That's why these are called non-thrombocytopenic papara. So you still have papyrus discoloration of the skin, but not that you have dysfunction of platelets or the protein mechanisms, but it's just that the capillaries are becoming more permeable to the extent that red blood cells can still leave the cardiovascular system to go to the tissues. So it's due to alterations in the capillaries themselves that result in many instances in increased permeability of these capillaries. So breeding disorders due to non-thrombocytopenic papara, so you have autoimmune disease. So you can have autoimmune disease that are attacking the blood vessel wall, increasing its permeability, and then you have movement of these blood, uh, blood cells to the tissues, like I said. So in case of autoimmune disease, you have allergic papyrus, you have drug-induced vascular papyrus, so there are certain drugs that can also induce this papyra, but it's non-thrombocytic, like I said. You can also have infections that can cause this bacterial infection like typhoid fever, scarlet fever, tuberculosis, viral infection, smallpox, influenza, and measles, and rickettsia, typhus, and protozoa, Marelia and toxoplasmosis, all these infections, they can result into increasing the permeability of blood vessels, and then you're going to have non-thrombocytic papara. Then you have structural malformation. So you have structural malformation due to the genetics. So these structural malformations, you have hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia. So you have hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, osteogenesis imperfecta, or scurvy. So all these are structural malformations that can also result into non-thrombocytopenic papara. Then you have thrombocytic papara. These thrombocytic papara, you have abnormal reduction in the number of circulating blood platelets. So here, what is being affected are the platelets count. So you have abnormal reduction in the number of circulating platelets. Patients develop focal hemorrhages to various tissues and also organs, including the skin and mucous membrane. So there are two basic forms of thrombocytic papara. So you have the primary with a non-etiology and then with secondary, which is with non-etiology. So the primary, you don't know the cause. Maybe you can just not say that there's an autoimmune disease that is resulting into thrombocytic papara, there's a reduction, the production of uh, these platelets, but the major cause is unknown. But in secondary, you know, maybe it could be due to low production of thrombocytin, like I said. So the secondary papara, there is non etiology or the cause of that, it's known. So let's start with idiopathic papara or primary thrombocytopenia. So idiopathic papara is also known as primary thrombocytopenia. So the, in primary thrombocytopenia, there is reduction in the number of platelets, but then the cause is unknown. That's why it's also called idiopathic. So you have autoimmune disorder in which a person becomes immunized and develops antibodies against his or her own platelets. So this is an autoimmune disease. What is causing that autoimmune disease is not known. So your own immune system is start producing antibodies against the platelets. So you go in the attack the platelets, and then there will be destruction of platelets. Then the platelet count will reduce. So that's why you have reduction in platelets count, hence the name thrombocytopenia. So you have an antiplatelet globulin, which results in a decrease in the number of circulating platelets when administered to normal patients. So these globulins, abnormal globulin that is against the platelets that can decrease the, the platelet count or the number of circulating platelets. So you have the acute form that you can see in children, often 
following a certain viral infection. So you can have a viral infection that can stimulate the immune system and this immune system not just uh, uh, attacking the virus to start attacking also the platelets. So you can have these viral infections that can trigger idiopathic papara or primary thrombocytopenia. Then you can also have the chronic form of idiopathic papara, which is also seen in adults. So it's chronic. So what are some of the clinical features that you're going to see in this idiopathic papara or primary thrombocytopenia? So what you already know is that there is a decrease in platelet count. So if you have a decrease in platelet counts, can you have abnormal uh, platelet plug formation? No. So what are the, some of the clinical formations? So you have spontaneous appearance of peparic or hemorrhagic lesions of the skin, which vary in size. So you have tiny red pinpoint petechiae to large pepperish ecmosis. So there's petechiation, there's ecmosis developing on the skin. Why? Right? Because you don't have normal coating mechanisms taking place within the body. So you can also have massive hematomas. And then you can have bruising tendency, epistaxis, bleeding from the nose, hematuria, you have blood in the urine, and then you have malena. Malena is whereby you are having bleeding in the gastrointestinal tract system, then that will result into production of black fecal material or stool, black stool, as a result of blood within the fecal material due to bleeding of gastrointestinal tracts. Then complications, you have intracranial hemorrhage or hemoplegia. So if you have intracranial hemorrhage, it will interfere with the normal function of the central nervous system. So you find that you can have hemiplegia. The oral manifestations, you have severe to profuse gingiva bleeding. So you can see here, you can have severe or profuse gingiva bleeding. Then you can have hemorrhage, maybe spontaneous, then petechi, palate. So you have the soft palate, hard palate. The hard palate and the soft palate, you can have petechiations taking place there. So you can see blood bleeding there. And then you can also have ecmosis. Ecmosis are bigger than petechiations. So petechiations are pinpoint bleeding. Then ecmosis, these are bigger in terms of the diameter. Then laboratory findings, very obvious that platelet count is usually below schiste platelets per cubic millimeter. So it's below the normal platelet count. The normal range, we say, is between 150,000 to 400,000 platelets per cubic millimeter of blood. But here, you're just having schiste, so there is a reduction in platelets. Then breeding time is prolonged, of course. So the breeding time will be prolonged because there is less platelets to form the platelet plug. Then coagulation time might be normal. So there's a difference between breeding time and coagulation time. The breeding time, you're looking at primary hemostasis. That is mainly dependent on the fraction of platelets for the formation of platelets plug. The coagulation time, you're looking at the coagulation pathways. And you remember, you have the extrinsic and the intrinsic pathway, of which I told you to say that the intrinsic will take about four to five, four to six minutes, and the extrinsic will take about 30 seconds. It's very fast. So this coagulation time, the normal coagulation time in a person should take about two to 10 minutes. So you find that it could be normal because here, the problem is not the coagulation factors. So the coagulation time will be still normal. But the problem here are the platelets. That's why you are having a bleeding time that is prolonged because bleeding is stopped by the coagulation of the platelets, the adhesion of platelets and the aggregation of platelets. And then later on, you have the fibrin coming in to stabilize that clot. Okay, then moving on to thrombotic thrombocytopenic papara. So thrombotic thrombocytopenic papara. So you have the unknown form, life-threatening mouth system disorder of an obscure nature, but may be immunologically mediated. So even here, it can be an autoimmune mediated papara. So it was first described by Eli Maskowitz in 1924. So more common in adults and is associated with pregnancy, 
disease such as HIV, cancer, bacterial infections, and vasculitis or inflammation of blood vessels. So this is from thrombotic, thrombocytopenic paper. So there's also a reduction in platelets count. So it's characterized by macro microangiopathy. So you have microangiopathy. This is just abnormal development of blood vessels or capillaries. So you have microangiopathy hemolysis, then you have platelet aggregation or high line from by in microcirculation. So this is just abnormal formation of clots that can be as a result of these abnormal levels of platelets or reduced levels of platelets. Then in terms of clinical features, so you have most well, the ones who are most affected are young adults, more common in females. You have thrombocytopenia, meaning that you have reduced uh, platelets count. Chemolytic anemia, you have anemia because you're losing blood or destruction of red blood cells that will result into anemia. So you have hemolytic anemia, fever, renal failure. On laboratory findings, you have fragmented red blood cells consistent with hemolysis, noted in the peripheral smear. So if you get a smear, you can see the fragmentation of red blood cells that will point to hemolysis. Then the kilocyte count is also elevated. You have, you can have uh, performing time or partial performing time that are within the normal limits because you don't have, you don't have a disease that is affecting the crouching factor. So the crouching factors are still okay. So the conversion of prothrombin into thrombin is still taking place. So you can have the prothrombin time or partial, partial prothrombin time that are within the normal limits. Then you have an increase in this enzyme, this is lactate dehydrogenase. So you can have an increase in lactate dehydrogenase enzyme. Why? It's because, you know, to say if you are destroying red blood cell, you'll be having more of anaerobic respiration. And this anaerobic respiration it will activate this enzyme, lactate dehydrogenase, because you are, you are converting pyruvate into lactic acid or lactate. So you need an enzyme that will break down the lactate. So this is the enzyme that is breaking down the lactate. It's called lactate dehydrogenase. Then you also have urinalysis. On urinalysis, you have proteinuria and hematuria. So proteinuria is an increase in proteins in the urine. Hematuria, you have blood in the urine. Then we move on to thrombocythemia. Thrombocythemia, just like you have polycythemia, an increase in red blood cells. So thrombocythemia is an increase in platelets or thrombocytosis, which is also an increase in platelets. So an increase in platelet count is called thrombocythemia or thrombocytosis. So condition characterized by an increase in the number of circulating blood platelets. So you have two forms. You have the primary. The primary, just not to say there's a non-etiology. The secondary, you can know the etiology. So the secondary occur after traumatic injury or inflammatory conditions, surgical procedures, or parturition. Parturition is a process of giving birth. So during parturition, you can also develop this kind of polycythemia. Then uh, these factors might be due to the overproduction of pro-inflammatory cytokines such as interleukin 1, 6, 11, that occur in chronic inflammatory, infective, and malignant states. So because we are producing a lot of these interleukins, and the interleukins can also go and stimulate the production of platelets. So you have an increase in platelet count because of this. On clinical features to be opposite with the reduction in platelets because here you're having an increase in platelet count. So what would be the clinical features? No gender or age predilection is seen. So you can't say that males are the ones that are affected or females are the ones that are affected or children are the ones that are affected or adults are the ones that are affected. So it can affect anyone. That's why there's no gender or age predilection that is seen. Bleeding tendency in spite of the fact that their platelet count is elevated. So despite having an increase in platelets, but you are still having bleeding disorders. Then you have epistaxis, bleeding from the nostrils, like I said, and then bleeding into 
genital urinary tract or central nervous system that can result into stroke and also blood in the urine and dysfunction when it comes to reproduction. The oral manifestations of thrombocythemia, you have spontaneous gingival bleeding as well, you have excessive and prolonged bleeding time. So prolonged bleeding also. Laboratory findings, platelet count is increased, of course, the clotting time, prothrombin time, clot retraction in tourniquet tests might be normal. Then the treatment is radioactive phosphorus, blood transfusion, corticosteroids, aspirin, and heparin. The corticosteroids, they can suppress the immunity, so they can suppress the production of those interleukins that are stimulating the production of platelets. So you can use glucocorticoids that can suppress the production of those interleukins. And then you're also reducing the production of platelets. Then you have congenital coagulopathies. These are congenital coagulopathies. So those that you are born with, something to do with your genetic makeup. So you have the hemophilia. You have three types of hemophilia. So when we are looking at protein factors, I also mentioned these hemophilia, that you have hemophilia A, B, and C depending on the clotting factors a person is lacking. So like I said, hemophilia, these are blood disease characterized by prolonged coagulation time and hemorrhagic tendencies. So it's hereditary disease, a defect being carried by the X chromosome. So the defect is on the X chromosome. So whenever the defect is seen on the X chromosome and it's recessive, it means that it will affect the males. So the females, they have two Xs. So if they have one which is recessive carrying that gene, they won't have the clinical manifestation of this disease. But in males, because they have one X and one Y, once they are carrying that recessive gene, it will express itself. So they will have a clinical manifestation of these diseases. So it's carried on the X chromosome, transmitted as a gender-linked Mendelian recessive trait, occurs only in males, like I said, transmitted through an affected daughter to a grandson. What I mean is if a female she has the gene, it's recessive, so she has another X that will be dominant, so she won't show clinical signs, but she'll be a carrier for that gene. So once she passed that recessive gene to the son, and this son will have one X with the carrier, or not, not necessarily the carrier, with one X that will have this recessive gene, then it will express itself because there's no any other gene to suppress it. The Y is different gene. So you find that in, in males, they will start express, expressing this disease once they are carrying that gene for hemophilia. So the etiology is dependent on which factor you're lacking. So in hemophilia A, there's lacking of plasma thromboplastinogen. This plasma thromboplastinogen is called factor eight. The other name is anti-hemophilic globulin. So it's also called anti-hemophilic globulin or factor eight. And you're not to say that for you to activate factor 10, you need the factor 8 complex. So without the factor 8 complex, the clotting mechanism will be disturbed because you can't activate the common pathway that will result into conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin. And then you have hemophilia B. In hemophilia B, they are lacking plasma from, from the plastin component. So they don't have this plasma from the plastin component which is called the Christmas factor. And this is factor nine. So when they are lacking factor nine, they will suffer from hemophilia B. Then you have the chronic form of hemophilia, which is called hemophilia C, which is not severe. The hemophilia C in these individuals, they are lacking plasma from the plastin antecedent factor, which is called factor 11. Hemophilia A is a deficiency of factor eight, like I said. So they are lacking factor eight. This is an anti-hemophilic factor. is inherited as X-linked recessive trait that affects males. The trait is carried in female without clinical evidence of the disease, like I've already explained. The clinical signs in hemophilia A, this is a severe case of hemophilia, and it's a common form of hemophilia. So you have hematomas, hema process, hematulia, you have gastrointestinal, bleeding, bleeding from lacerations, head trauma, spontaneous intracranial bleeding, joint synovitis or 
if I mention or oh, synovial joints, which is called synovitis, and then hemophilic anthropathies, and then intramuscular bleed, and also pseudo tumors. Pseudo tumors, you find that when you're checking for these clots under, under ultrasound, you can mistake them for tumors. So they are more like hematomas, but you think that they are tumors. So they are called pseudo tumor, a tumor that is false, that is not true cancerous tissue, so they are called pseudo-tumors. Hemophilia B is due to lack of this factor, plasma thromboplastin component. So you have due to plasma thromboplastin deficiency, also known as Christmas disease. So this Christmas disease, it was called Christmas disease because the first patient that was described with this disease was a small boy in 1952 by the name of Stefan Christmas. So he was the first one to be described. So this disease was referred to as Christmas disease or hemophilia B. So the other name of hemophilia B is also called Christmas disease. It doesn't mean that people suffered from this disease on Christmas Day. No, it has got nothing to do with the, birth of, with the birth of Jesus Christ. It has got more to do with the person who was involved with this disease. His name was Stephen, uh, Stephen Christmas. So because he was the first patient to be described with this disease, and then the disease was called the Christmas disease or hemophilia B. So there are two forms, apparently. So you have normal levels of inactive protein and also another in which there is a deficiency level in coagulant factor. Then you also have hemophilia C. Like I said, hemophilia C is due to lack of factor 11. So this is also an autosomal dominant trait disease. So breeding symptoms due to the breeding symptoms do occur but are usually mild. So this is just a mild case of hemophilia. So even if they show some clinical signs, but they are not as severe as hemophilia A and B. Then you also have anticoagulant related coagulopathies. These anticoagulant related coagulopathies, you have heparin, and you know to say heparin is an anticoagulant. So if you have excessive production of heparin, you know to say you have issues with bleeding because you know to say it's going to inhibit the coagulation cascade because of that you can have excessive bleeding so they are called anticoagulant related coagulopathies so you have heparin short duration of action three to four hours you have acute anticoagulation so you have acute anticoagulation so you are inhibiting coagulation because of heparin you know to say heparin can bind with antithrombin 3 to significantly inhibit activation of factors 9, 10, and 11. So there's inhibition of factor 9, 10, and 11, thereby reducing thrombin generation in fibrin formation. So fibrin formation is inhibited. So secondary hemostasis is inhibited because of heparin. So indications, heparin can be used for prophylaxis or treatment for various thromboembolism, including prophylaxis in medical and surgical patients. So those patients that are going for surgery find that they can be given heparin as for prophylaxis so that it can inhibit um, blood clotting. Because you know to say after cutting, you have a lot of clots that, that can form. So if you want to inhibit those clotting, due to surgery, you can give heparin, but you need to be very careful with the dose because you find that after surgery, these patients, they can't, they can't facilitate coagulation of blood and that can also result into excessive breathing. Then you have coumarin anticoagulants, the coumarin anticoagulants, which include the warfarin and the coumaro. So the warfarin is a derivative of the coumaro, so these are chemicals that are extracted from sweet clover. So this is a plant, sweet clover. It's the one that can produce this warfarin. So you find that there are certain hunters, they know to say that in sweet clover, there is warfarin and dicomaro. So you find that they can extract the warfarin and dicomaro and then they will put at the arrow, you know to say once they hit an animal or 
they, they hunt an animal, it will go down very easily. Why? Because once you start breeding, then it can't recover from that because of these chemicals. So these are anticoagulants that can be also used as drugs. So indication, they prevent recurrent thromboembolism events. So they are going to inhibit from by formation or coating formation. So they're going to prevent recurrent thromboembolism events such as pulmonary embolism, venous, venous thrombosis, and then stroke and also myocardial infarction. So they can be given in these conditions because they're going to inhibit coagulation. So the recurrent of these diseases will be inhibited because there's no longer uh, the coating factors that can be activated to form a, um, a coat. So you know to say they're going to prevent the currency of these diseases like pulmonary embolism, venous thrombosis, stroke, and also myocardial infarction. Then they slow thrombin production and coat formation by blocking the action of vitamin K. So they're going to slow down the production of thrombin. You know, to say without thrombin, there is no conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin. There is no formation of fibrin polymers. On top of that, it's going to inhibit the production of vitamin K. And you know, to say vitamin K is required for the production of other coating factors. Remember, there are about four coating factors that require uh, the presence of vitamin K for their production in the liver. So you have vitamin two. I mean, you have coating factor two the prothrombin itself, then the coating factor seven, then the coating factor number nine, and the coating factor number 10. So these coating factors, they are dependent on vitamin K. So without vitamin K, then there is no production of these coating factors. So you can't produce prothrombin, which is coating factor number two, you can't produce uh, coating factor number five, you can't produce coating factor number nine, you can't produce coating factor number 10. So the coagulation cascade can't proceed without these coating factors. So it's going to inhibit coagulation. Then sometimes when you're taught to go and collect blood, it's either you can use a tube that contains EDTA. So you have EDTA tube. So you have EDTA tubes that you can use if you don't want this blood clot. Why is it because EDTA is an anticoagulant? So it's called ethylene diamino tetraacetic. So the ethylene diamino tetraacetic, this is an anticoagulant. So it's a strong anticoagulant. It prevents blood clotting by removing calcium from the blood. So it's going to remove calcium from the blood. And you know to say, for you to form those three complexes, complex number eight, factor eight complex, Factor five complex, factor seven complex. All these complexes to form, you will need calcium as a core factor. You also need phospholipids. So for them to activate the factor 10 and the factor 10 to activate factor eight, for you to come up with factor, I mean, for factor 10 to activate factor five, for you to come up with factor five complex, you need calcium. So without, cal without calcium, there is no activation of the coagulation pathways so there will be no coagulation that's why you need the editor tube for you to collect blood that you don't want that blood to clot because it's going to remove the calcium from there no blood coagulation there then you have disease related coagulopathy so these are disease related coagulopathies so you have liver diseases like i say the liver is involved in the production of a lot of factors starting with factor one factor two factor seven factor nine factor ten so there are a lot of factors that are being produced by the liver so any disease that is destroying the function of the liver or that is destroying the liver will inhibit the production of the coating factors and then you have issues with coating mechanisms as well because you won't have these factors that are coming from the liver so liver disease owing to impaired protein synthesis important factors inhibitors of the coating and fibrinolytic systems are markedly reduced additionally there's abnormal vitamin k dependent factor and fibrinogen molecules have been encountered. So you have homocytopenia, reduction, platelets production. Because for you to have platelets, you also need 
thrombopoietin that is also coming from the liver. So if there's liver damage, you expect to have thrombocytopenia. Then you can also have thrombocytopathy, thrombocytopathy, which are also common. So vitamin K deficiency, I've told you that there are factors that are dependent on vitamin K. So you have factor two, factor seven, factor nine, factor 10. These are dependent on vitamin K. So if you don't have vitamin K, then you can't produce these factors. If you don't have a functional liver, you can't produce these factors as well. So if the liver is okay, then you're just lacking vitamin K. You find that if you supplement vitamin K, these patients will, will be fine because now the liver will be able to produce these factors with the presence of the vitamin K. So sometimes vitamin K is used for treatment. If you have bleeding disorders and then you you do an investigation, you find that the patient is lacking vitamin K, so you can just supplement vitamin K that will help the patient. Then you also have disseminated intravascular coagulation, which is called DIC. So disseminated intravascular coagulation that is triggered by potent stimuli that activate both factor, factor 12 and tissue factor. So this is a stimuli that is activating factor 12 and tissue factor that will result into blood clotting. So you have the formation of microthrombi and these emboli throughout the microvasculature. So those small blood vessels, you're going to have generalized blood clotting. So this DCI, DIC or disseminated intravascular coagulation can produce massive hemorrhage and can be life-threatening. Why is it? Because you're going to use up all the coating factors. So if you're going to use up all the coating factors because there are multiple locations where you're having this coagulation, that's why you have microphrombi that are forming within uh, the microvasculature. So you're going to use up much of these coating factors and then when you have damage, it's very difficult for the clot to form because most of them they have already been used up. So they could be life-threatening. Then you have fibrinolytic disorders or fibrinolytic disorders. So here you have a deficiency maybe in plasminogen activator inhibitor. So if you have a deficiency in plasminogen activator inhibitor, then there is more activation of fibrinogen into, uh, there is more activation of plasminogen into plasmin. So here the deficiency is in plasminogen inhibitor. And so if you have deficiency in plasminogen activator inhibitors, it means that there will be more conversion of plasminogen into plasmin that will result into digestion of fibrin. So you also have issues with bleeding, with fibrinolytic disorders. I think this is just too much of information. So we're going to end here. So there is another component that I'm supposed to start with you guys, looking at the lymphatic system, but deliberately I left it out. So I'm going to include it when we start looking at the cardiovascular system or the circulatory system. So the lymphatic system, it will be incorporated with the cardiovascular system. So now we've covered all the information in blood physiology. So we've covered blood physiology, starting from lecture one to lecture eight. So you need to study these notes. And then you also need to go to the recommended textbooks to go and look for extra information and study them. On Tuesday, you are having your quiz two, blood physiology quiz two. Then on Wednesday, you're going to have your test. So these quiz two and test to be online test and quiz. So I hope you prepare yourself adequately for the quiz. Otherwise. I wish you all the best in your studies and may God bless you as you continue with your medical scope. So I know physiology is not the only course, but you need to pay attention to physiology because if you're not, then to give you problems. But this is one of the simple courses that you're going to have in this semester. So just be dedicated to your books, you know, whatever assignment I'm giving you, you need to read or not, to read on and also to go for extra information. So there will also be extra videos that I'll be posting just to help you understand these mechanisms. Okay, so this is where I'm going to end my physiology classes or physiology lectures. Thank you very much for your time.
COE needs again 